Hey, all my critics out there, welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you have sent me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com. And that email is in the description section below on YouTube here. If you would like to uh, send me any questions, get them in my question queue, that is how you do it. Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to 2021. I hope that this year is significantly better for all of us than 2020 was. We've got a lot of work still to do, a lot of logistics to solve, a lot of vaccines to distribute, and a lot of science to teach people. So uh, let's hope that we can make that happen as quickly as possible. And in the meantime, I will do my best to continue to entertain, inform, and educate here on this channel about destructive cult, Scientology, um, coercive control, undue influence, science, critical thinking, and anything else that I want to jam in here. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get on with your questions. We've got some good ones this week. Vaguely, Scientology seems to quite happily move people around jobs or chuck them in the RPF. What happens when work needs to be done, but their members who are builders, electricians, computer programmers, or whatever other skilled people are all shifted to other positions or thrown in the RPF? Do they expect completely unskilled replacements from elsewhere in the Sea Org to take over to do complex technical or dangerous tasks with no training? Would they shove qualified electricians into PR or management roles where they would not be suitable either? Basically, the answer to your question is yes, they would. Um, but they're not all complete idiots about it. However, I'm going to go over a couple of Sea Org policies with you that will sort of, I want to give you exactly how L. Ron Hubbard talks to Sea Org members on this so that you'll understand what they're indoctrinated with in terms of an attitude about how you do your job and how you learn how to do your job and what you should and shouldn't know coming into the Sea Org because it is a high demand, high control environment. And that means that expectations are high. You are not being given a lot of excuses or reasons why you can't do something. You are expected to get things done. The attitude is, um, you're here, you're a Scientologist, uh, now we'd rather have you dead than incapable, right? This kind of thing, this is right out of basic policies that all Sea Org members read, like keeping Scientology working is the name of one of them. But there are also Sea Org specific issues uh, that go even more hardcore on this. So I pulled those up. But I wanted to uh, also remind you that uh, even words like reasonable are redefined in Scientology as bad words. As you know, it's not okay to be reasonable. <laughs> you know, really, like the mindset is a different mindset. So let me. Um, so the, and that's these are the ways that it's different. Is that reasons or justifications or excuses why you can't get something done are simply unacceptable. If you're given a task in the Sea Org, it is expected that you are going to get it done. And if you can't get it done, you are to figure out how to get it done without making a big problem out of it. That is pretty uniform across the, um, uh, you know, sort of across the Sea Org. Now, um, the unreasonableness comes into this in that sometimes people really do not have a clue how to do something. Um, and it doesn't matter. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't matter. Now, when it comes to very specialized stuff, like, you know, laying some concrete or doing some, you know, intense electrical work or something, it's not like some senior who knows how to do that or understands that process is going to give that job to somebody who's never done it before and expect them to just figure it out. I mean, generally, there is an effort made at what's called hatting or, you know, indoctrination training, you know, figuring out, uh, tr showing people how to do the work that they need to do. But it's minimal, right? It's really minimal. And uh, OSHA standards, for example, when it comes to compliance with law and with, and with uh, the operational safety hazard, whatever OSHA, I think that's a uh, what that stands for, anyway, safety rules on the job and, you know, in construction areas or, or uh, industrial areas, 
Scientology doesn't really care too much about that. However, they also, you know, the, the, the conflict there, of course, is they do want to take care of the Sea Org members. But there's also this whole idea that if you screw up, have an accident, hurt yourself, hurt other people, it's because you're PTS. It's not because you don't know what you're doing. It's not because you weren't trained on it. It's because you are somehow connected to some suppressive or had some suppressive restimulation or something. So it's not like this all makes a whole lot of sense, okay? But it is a different mindset. So let me give you the Hubbard on this, and um, then um, and then we then I think you'll understand the answer to your question because I, I think by giving you this, I'll give you a more you know, here's the attitude about it. Here's how it is in Scientology. And then, you know, you can kind of see how this might work. Uh, on the 5th of June, 1968, L. Ron Hubbard wrote The Winning Attitude. This was a flag order, 833. All Sea Org members are considered to be able to do any job and perform the total actions of his or her post. You all have been around for a long time, and nothing you have to learn is totally new. Quote unquote stupidity, or quote unquote being new, are not excuses for not doing your job. Any Sea Org officer or in charge not expecting the full performance out of his personnel is a danger to the Sea Org. Any Sea Org officer not allowing a person under him or her to learn or perform totally the functions of his post or assuming that he can't is a liability to the Sea Org. This attitude of, well, he really can't do that because he's new or he doesn't know yet is canceled. The winning attitude is you know it now with no ifs, ands, or buts. I do my job. I'm expected to do it right the first time. I do. I expect no less of you, L. Ron Hubbard. All right. And then we can also go to something that I have mentioned many times before. And I won't read the whole issue, but I am going to read some snippets here because this is also going to get this across. And this was 19 August 1967. And uh, 1967 is the year the Sea Org started. And it was the year that Hubbard became a real taskmaster in a way that did not become apparent before. This is called the Supreme Test. It starts, all capital letters, the Supreme Test of a Thetan is his ability to make things go right. This, of course, is a rather savage and brutal datum, for it thrusts aside all justification, reasonableness, excuses, and even does not take into account the size or obstacles of the opposition. But please note that the datum is not, are things all right around him, as this is a passive test and could mean only that he was simply sitting still. Whether things are currently all right or not is beside the point. The Thetan who is making things go right may be tackling a mountain of confusion, and of course things are not all right, because what he is attacking is mainly wrong. It is whether or not he is making things go right in spite of hell or high water, that is the test. Okay, this is used constantly in Scientology. This is not a Sea Org only issue, this is a bulletin, any Scientologist can look this up and see it and is often referred to or used to as a as a sort of bootstrapper or you know hey let's get going you know pick yourself up and let's get let's get to it right now hubbard also defines in here one might also ask what is meant by right this would be forwarding a purpose not destructive to the majority of the dynamics All right, this is where we get into the utilitarian ethics of Scientology. The greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics is the computation you're supposed to use or the calculus you use to decide whether something you're doing is a good thing or a bad thing. Is is it most productive or constructive or helpful? Does it do the, you know, deliver the greatest good to the greatest number of life units uh, across the dynamics? And dynamics are a Scientology term, but basically it means over the areas or spheres of life. So... 
Uh, Hubbard then goes into talking about how sanity is crookedness and how a sane person thinks, looks, and sees in straight lines. Black is black, white is white. The aberrated person looks toward black and wanders off in his gaze to something else and makes the error of saying it is gray. Hubbard is really pushing some interesting things in this issue. That's why I wanted to read a little bit of it to you. Black and white thinking is one of them. He actually, literally, I just read to you how Hubbard says black and white thinking is a plus. It's a feature. It's a bonus. It's what you should be doing. It's a reflection of sanity to be a black and white thinker. It is also um, this whole utilitarian ethics system that Hubbard adopted and pushes here with this business of making things go right is all about the end justifying the means. If you're on a right path, if you are have a purpose that is a good purpose as you see it, then make it go right. Do anything necessary in order to make that purpose manifest. Okay, so these are some things that are here in these issues if you read between the lines or, you know, dig into what has Hubbard actually saying here. And these attitudes, of course, are part of our cultic checklist of things that are that can be turned into very, very abusive philosophies or very, very abusive ways of uh, acting or thinking or pushing people. So with your now having given all of that, right, getting back to your question here, let me say that um, people in the Sea Org are expected to get any job done that they are assigned at any time at of the day or night or any time of the year, right? And uh, if it is truly a technical job that is acknowledged that, you know, you're going to need to know some things. No one is ever going to be given the job go wire that building, <laughs> right? And they have no idea. They've never picked up a wire before. They don't know anything about electricity. No one's really going to do that, okay? Um, but uh, this serves to, um, like I said, when I say it, this serves to open the door for abuses. For example, let me give you just a stupid, silly example of the kind of thing that... Um, is just given over for you to do, to figure out, you know, and, and where this kind of thing manifests is there was a conference and we had a very senior executive at this conference speaking to org staff members. And I was in management and this was in the Sea Org. And um, this executive wanted a glass of uh, orange juice. And we were out at a hotel. We weren't on the base. I didn't have any money. Nobody had any money for me. I was just supposed to go make it go right to go get this guy a glass of orange juice. And I wandered around the hotel for almost 45 minutes trying to go to the hotel cook or the hotel bar or the hotel restaurant or go up and down the street looking for a place I could find some orange juice. I had no money, but I was expected to make it go right. Just go figure it out. It's not my problem. And I was telling my senior, I'm like, how am I supposed to do this? And literally, she looked at me and said, I don't give a fuck. You go figure it out. It's not my job to do your job for you. Go. And by the way, it wasn't my job to get people orange juice. <laughs> so uh, these kind of things are the heat of the moment kind of crap that you get. And it doesn't sound like any big deal except for the fact that I was totally stuck with that, right? And I got a lot of trouble because I couldn't find out, figure out how to get some guy some orange juice. I mean, you know, stupid stuff like that. But uh, while I was on the RPF, uh, we were uh, trained on doing different jobs, electricians, plumbing, HVAC, and, uh, of course, working in a mill. I learned how to use a table saw and power saws and power drills and lots of lathes and, you know, scrapers and sanders and all kinds of things. And I didn't really have a whole lot of clue about most of that before I got there. So the hatting or the training you get is pretty you know, boom, 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 minimal amount to get the job done, and you're expected to do it at the highest quality possible. So um, so the standards are a bit ridiculous. The demands are completely, utterly ridiculous. And the attitude is, uh, if you're going to make, you know, you're going to make it go right. And that's, that's life in the Sea Org. Kevin Zay. Earlier on in the current season of The Mandalorian, we learn that the whole masked creed thing is connected to a terrorist cult on the Mandalorian home world. In your opinion, how closely related is Din Djarin's experience to finding out that there are many more of his kind who freely show their faces to anyone to one's real-world experience of coming out of a cult mindset? 
Yeah, Kevin, that was definitely pretty interesting, wasn't it? If, for those not familiar, The Mandalorian is a science, is a Star Wars uh, series that is on the Disney Channel and is a continuation or is a sort of a, a new storyline within the Star Wars universe following the original, the events of the original uh, uh, trilogy and before the events of the last trilogy, the, the, the horrifying, awful trilogy. And this follows a bounty hunter named uh, Jin Jaren, and he is a Mandalorian, and he's the title character of the show. And so he is running around with his helmet on, and he never takes it off. There's a code of conduct he follows, which is called the way. And or the um, the it, there's a group that this is that this that this Mandalorian code or the the, the way is is a part of called the Children of the Watch. Okay, and this is the name of the organization or group that he is basically part of. And it's a pretty loosely knit underground organization. It's not, you know, got a single leader and all that. It's it's kind of interesting the way it's sort of semi-loosely, very, very loosely organized with uh, really the only thing tying these people together is this code of conduct and an agreement that they will support one another if they get into trouble and they are there to have each other's backs, even if they personally disagree or think that they're off the rails or doing something wrong. Uh, there is inner conflict within the members, but it, they have this overall overarching sort of purpose and showing their faces to anybody at all, any living person, completely verboten. That's just the, one of the only real points of this code that we actually know about. This whole mythology or structure or dogma is very, very loosely put together on the show so far. We haven't seen a whole lot of real certain information about it. So it's kind of interesting because it's like, well, is it a cult or is it really just bordering on a very hardcore, honor-based, maybe Bushido night of the, you know, the when the knights were in flower sort of code of conduct, right? Is it that kind of a thing? Because that's more how it's sort of presented. Although this, when he runs into this Bo-Katan character who lets him know, hey, guess what? All you guys running around with these masks on, uh, with the helmets on, you never take them off. Yeah, you guys are part of some cult. We don't really, we, the rest of us Mandalorians aren't doing that. Um, that was a bit of a shock, a rude awakening to him. He had not run into any other Mandalorians except people who had been following the way. And so he'd been raised thinking that the main character, the Mandalorian, Jin, he thought that all Mandalorians followed the code he followed because he wasn't born on Mandaloria or whatever the name of the planet is, and he wasn't raised there. He Anybody can be a Mandalorian if they follow this code. So, uh, or at least can be a children of the child of the watch, right? Or be part of this thing called the tribe, which was the group that took him. So, and like I said, it's a little loosey goosey. This is not a well laid out, fully formatted, fully figured out sort of thing yet. So, from the mindset that, you know, maybe you would rather die than take your helmet off, which was an, an option at one point for the Mandalorian in one of the shows. And, um, you know, you got a rather strict code there. Um, Bushido, the way, you know, these kind of things. I mean, um, uh, Favreau has acknowledged that he was influenced on this, on writing this show very much by a Japanese manga and a series of movies and TV shows called Lone Wolf and Cub about a samurai who had been uh, set up and disgraced and he had his child, his one-year-old baby with him. And they took off out of the imperial palace, you know, and escaped and lead this life having adventures and running around doing, you know, good things. And very, very much similar to the formatting of how the Mandalorian put together with this, you know, bounty hunter and this child, you know, baby Yoda. So anyway, a lot of, a lot of similarities there. I think that his awakening process, which is what you're asking me about, really, now that I've kind of had to explain all this. I think that's the part that's most been most interesting to watch for me because he took his helmet off a few times after that. And um, clearly he is sort of, you know, more open to sort of thinking about, oh, maybe this idea, this dogma that I've adhered to my whole life 
maybe there are options for me here. And that's interesting because it might open the door for season three to have even more of that. And of course, that would probably be a fairly sensible thing for that character to do because running around and keeping your helmet on all the time is a little uncomfortable and annoying. And it shouldn't really be that, you know, this, this is some, uh, it, it's a very, very arbitrary rule. There doesn't really seem to be a whole lot of rhyme or reason to it. So um, maybe at one, you know, I wonder, I wonder if there wasn't a period where in, in just sort of wondering where this kind of rulemaking might come from. Remember that the Mandalorians and the Jedi are old, old, old adversaries or enemies. And so we've got this dark saber now in the mix uh, being added to the Star Wars mythology. But I wonder if maybe the basis for this rule or similar behavior from back in the day might have been because maybe their helmets were made out of a material that was somewhat force resistant. It wasn't really tested or talked about at all uh, as far as mind reading or telepathy goes in the show so far that a Jedi would be reading the Mandalorian's thoughts, at least not that I remember. If, I, if, I, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But I don't remember any Jedi probing the um, Jin's thoughts. And I'm wondering whether a helmet made out of Baskar, the armor that they use, the metal that they use, which is resistant to lightsabers. It's the only thing that lightsabers won't just go right through. I wonder if it might be force resistant as well. And so the rule comes out of, you know, they don't want to have the Jedi reading their minds, so they never take their helmets off. I'm completely making that up right now, but um, I guess we'll see what happens. Thanks for the question, Kevin. Steve Wood. Hubbard clearly states that if anything is not right in your life, Scientology can fix it. If it is not fixed, it is because you are, quote, pulling it in, end quote. Nothing can be Scientology's fault. It can only be yours. If you're unable to discover the cause of whatever your problems might be, Scientology will tell you that it must be because you created this issue in a past life. How convenient. So how was it that LRH was unable to handle his own demons? It's now common knowledge that he had multiple strokes, needed medications, suffered from dementia, and in the end, hid away living in a paranoid and lonely small world of his own making. In short, Scientology completely and utterly failed to save him. What do Scientologists make of this incredible fact? All right, Steve, thanks for the question. Um, I'm not quite sure how I haven't gotten this across yet in the, in the many questions that I've answered of yours, but let me reiterate that what you know about Scientology and the things I talk about and Leah's talked about, Mike's talked about, Marty, everybody else— are things that Scientologists don't know and refuse to let themselves know. There's a thing called willful ignorance. Scientologists do not go on the internet, do not look up information about L. Ron Hubbard, and they are fed a biography, really literally, the, the, the right word is a hagiography, a, a, the, the, the biography of a religious figure as told by the church, um, and they are fed this hagiography of Hubbard, this, this, this completely made up bogus biography that he was born, the, this very able young child who could, who could raise, uh, ride horses and bucking broncos and, and read at the age of three and knew that his purpose was to save mankind very early on. And his entire life was a quest for knowledge and skill and spiritual awareness and ability. And he was on this path from, you know, from day one forward and blah, 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 blah. Right. And he didn't flunk out of college and he was a war hero and he was this wonderful, successful pillar of foundation of the golden age of Pulp Fiction. And he was this uh, brilliant writer and, you know, adored and loved by millions. And the world just can't wait to get hold of L. Ron Hubbard's technology and, and use it to, you know, create saner and more wonderful conditions for all of us. This this is the Scientology mindset. They do not want to hear anything critical or bad about L. Ron Hubbard, and they surely do not want that biography to be contradicted by the truth. So they're not going to look it up, 
right? They're going to accept that he's a war hero. They're going to accept that 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 if it, in the face of any contradictory information, it is the contradictory, it's the people outside the church, the government, the FBI, right? The CIA, uh, the, the, the news media, Leah Remini, us, us nasty ex-members, all of us, All of it can be just shoved right off the table like a cat just pushing it right over. We don't have to listen to that. We don't have to hear that. I don't want to know. That's what Scientologists do. So they don't know the things you know about L. Ron Hubbard and his life. And when people try to tell them those things, they shut down. They don't want to hear it. That's what a cult mindset is all about. And it's what I keep trying to get across is that that on the subject of the person's extremism, in this case, Scientology, could be Jehovah's Witnesses, could be the, it could be anything, could be a terrorist group, could be a domestic situation, whatever, wherever the extremist beliefs and behavior lie, you have a situation where the person is unable to think critically on that topic. They simply can't do it. And until they have some kind of emotional event, something that is that is emotionally impactful to them to snap them out of that fog, they can't accept that new information. It, it creates what's called cognitive dissonance. And that noise is very uncomfortable to them. And, re- and the way they will resolve that noise is not to go, huh, you're making a very interesting point. I think I'd like to know more about that. See, that would be a rational way. A good critical thinker would would res, would respond that way when faced with contradictory information. Is huh? Tell me more about that. You know, if they didn't know, if they didn't, you know, it's like, oh, this is new. I, I didn't know about this. What what's this all about? Scientologists don't do that. If you tell them, L. Ron Hubbard you know, died in hiding, had stroke, Scientology didn't save him. And in fact, his, you know, his will was corrupted. David Miscavige took over. You try to tell them that they're going to shut you down. Like before you even get five words out of your mouth. And, And if you did manage to get it all out, they would just look at you. Well, that's not true. No, I don't believe that. I don't even know where you're getting that from. That's a bunch of crap. That's just, there's there's no way that's true, right? That's going to be their response. There's no way that they can accept that information as true. It's too contradictory to this entire foundation of belief that they have built up. And in fact, that foundation is not just a foundation of belief. It's actually prison walls, and they are in a prison of belief. Okay, remember my earlier analogy um, to the um, thought fortress. You know, you've got a thought fortress fortress of belief. And you're not going to batter down the walls of that thought fortress, you know, with facts and reason and evidence and expect to, to change a cult member's mind. So, so, so where I'm trying to go here, Steve, is that Scientologists don't have the problem of, oh, wow, Hubbard didn't solve his life with Scientology. Well, why am I doing this? Like, none of them think that way. So that's my answer to your question is it does it doesn't it doesn't even come up that way right because that's not how they they don't acknowledge the truth of any of the things that you said in your question and that's why they don't get it and that's why you will have a very hard time if you ever try to talk to a Scientologist about this and convince them hey man what the hell like you know Hubbard this Hubbard this Hubbard this they're just going to look at you and go those are all lies none of that's true and I don't want to hear anything more about it. And if you keep talking to me about it that way, we're not going to have a, we're not going to be having a relationship anymore. That is a Scientologist responding to that kind of information. So, if you can if you can get further than that, you know, great. But tread cautiously because they're only going to go so far. There you go, Jonathan Perry. One thing every ex-Scientologist I've seen seems to agree about is that one good and useful thing is the communications course. What do they teach and what makes it so effective? Okay, thanks for the question here. So the communications class. Now, actually not every single Scientologist agrees that the communications class was the you know, was a wonderful, awesome, amazing thing. John Atak and I have actually talked about it a little bit, and he's, he's convinced that it's not a good thing at all. 
And actually, at this point, I've put enough time and distance and, and, and learning between myself and Scientology that I, too, would say that. I have said in the past that the communications class had taught some interesting and valuable skills in that you find a lot of people out there have a hard time looking at somebody in the eyes have a hard time being able to communicate in such a way that another person can hear them. They have a hard time communicating where people will say things to them and they never answer. They never acknowledge. They never like, oh, yeah, I heard you. I got that, right? And that kind of thing can set up problems in, in, in communication on a mechanical basis. But that's pretty much all Scientology has to offer for you is mechanical solutions to the problems of communication. There is a ton of stuff related to communication that is not at all in Scientology and, uh, and is it never going to be in Scientology because Hubbard was a bit simpleton about this. And he figured, well, I've got a formula for communication, which is cause. Here, I'll use these, uh, these two little people here to demonstrate. Cause and then distance between the two people, right? And then effect. So this person says something, it goes across this distance, and this person receives it. That's communication as far as L. Ron Hubbard is concerned, and that's all there really is to communication as far as L. Ron Hubbard is concerned. Um, there is a lot more to communication than that. <laughs> there's a lot more to language, there's a lot more to understanding, there's a lot more to the ways we communicate. I mean, and Hubbard just kind of blew all that stuff off. He said, yeah, all that stuff's just complicated nonsense. We figured it out with just this. Well, no, you didn't. And, um, and people end up, unfortunately, as a result of being told that and taught that, they are being um, thinking that if they come out of Scientology or thinking that they've done this class in Scientology, and now they know all about all the important stuff in communication. Not so much. Um, it, is it helpful? Sure. It, it could be helpful for certain people under certain circumstances, but um, I don't think it's very helpful to sit for hours on end with your eyes open or closed in a trance state. And that is a thing, and it's something that I believe is real, and it is something that I have observed and experienced myself because I did hundreds and hundreds of hours of TRs, of the training routines, in Scientology, and I don't find, I, it was all a spectacular waste of time as far as I'm concerned. Hours and hours and hours of just sitting in a chair staring at somebody. You know, at not, not really that great. If anything, these are drills in compliance. And, uh, and there are other drills, by the way, that are literally about control and compliance that are built up on top of those communication drills. So, um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't have good things to say about this stuff at this point. And you can refer to earlier Q&As I did where I did describe the TRs in detail. So I'm not going to do that again here. But um, there you go. I hope that, hope that get, helps somewhat with that. Brandon O'Neill. I'm wondering if you have any background on the truly strange and cartoony book covers the Church of Scientology used back in the 70s. Surely Hubbard was involved in the design in some way, but if he was trying to present his ideas as a serious science, why go with such weird covers? Honestly, though, some of them are still preferable to the spooky and severe covers that the books have now. Hey, thanks for the question. You know, I reached out to Jefferson Hawkins, an old friend of mine who is in was in Scientology and actually worked directly on the marketing and public relations lines of Scientology and designed and worked on exactly the kind of thing you're asking me about. So I, I asked him, and here's exactly what he said on this. He said, there wasn't any reasoning behind these. They were supposedly implant pictures from the R6 bank, which is another term in Scientology for the reactive mind, which we've talked about any number of times here. They were supposed to key people in and compel them to get the book and read it. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about this after I finish reading Jeff's answer here. The art was created by a guy named Richard Gorman. Hubbard said that he keyed in very well and so could duplicate the images. Hubbard gave a whole lecture about these symbols in 1966 or 67 
when the ship was in Marseille. You had to be OT3 to hear the lecture, so one of the first things I did when I completed OT3 was find this lecture and listen to it. He described all these symbols, including the volcano and the R6 god face, and how these were supposed to draw people to get the books and come into Scientology. They are supposedly implanted pictures from the R6 bank. Okay, so that was Jeff's answer on this, and basically what all that gobbledygook means is that Hubbard had the idea that people on planet Earth have all suffered from the same mental implants done millions and millions of years ago, all the way up to present time in your between lives area. When you die, you, you, your body dies, you're a phaeton, you're a spirit, you're floating around, you got to go get another body. And you have all these compulsions and implants and commands telling you to go get another body. So it's really not much choice on your part. You can't just go flit off and and go make a planet or go make your own universe or something, you're too screwed up So because of all these implants. Now, Hubbard said that there are a lot of implants that we all have in common, being stuck here on this planet. Um, and these symbols that Jeff refers to, this, this god face of this bearded man, or the volcanoes. The, the volcano is imagery right out of the OT3 uh, Xenu narrative. And Hubbard said that volcanoes are extremely re-stimulative. They will key you in. And this is loaded language. This is Scientology terminology for basically re-traumatizing you by showing you images that remind you of incidents of stress, pain, and trauma in the past. That's keying in or re-stimulating. That's what those words mean, is you'd had something really bad happen to you, very painful, it, you know, truly in the past. Maybe you even died from it. But as a spiritual entity, you're going to remember all this stuff. And so it can re-stimulate if you see things or, or re-perceive uh, perceptions or experiences that approximate the earlier time. So... That's where all these symbols, that's what all these symbols are supposedly about and why the book covers look so weird is because they're supposed to re-stimulate you. And Hubbard thought that he would use these mechanisms of control in his own little twisted way to control people to come into Scientology and buy Scientology services because they'd be compelled to because of these symbols And therefore, Scientology would clear the planet. Now, this is all complete nonsense and bunk. And as you can tell from Scientology's lack of wild popularity, all of this stuff doesn't work in any way. But Hubbard thought it did, and that's how he ran his organization. And there you go. All right, let's do some flash answers. Barney Saunders, if you had made it to OT3 as a Scientologist, would you have believed it? I am 1,000% sure that I would have. Absolutely, I would have taken it all in. And in fact, I would have been super, super excited about it. And I would have wanted to have known everything about it as soon as I could. And uh, and yeah, I definitely would have believed it as a Scientologist. April Goodson. I have noticed that a lot of married people in Scientology have different last names. Is there a reason for that or just a random thing? I think it's just a random thing. Although in the Sea Org, I will say that I saw people get married up to five different times. And it's a hassle having to pay for and file the paperwork for the women to change their last names every time. So I'm pretty sure that they just, after the you know second or third marriage, they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, if they even change it after the first one. Travis, what is your estimate of the number of active Scientologists currently? Is the Church of Scientology shrinking or is it remaining static? Does Scientology still have a strong presence in Hollywood or has that changed? Uh, As I've said many, many times, Travis, I do not have accurate figures. No one does on the, um, on the, the numbers in Scientology, but our best estimates, somewhere around 30, 35,000 people internationally, worldwide, including staff and Sea Org. And I believe Scientology is shrinking, and I believe it would have had to have over this last year, given the fact that Miscavige hasn't been able to do his Nuremberg briefings and 
and they actually have boarded orgs closed. Uh, I went over this in my podcast this week, if you guys didn't see that. So, yeah. And as strong as a strong presence in Hollywood, eh, you know, uh, not really. Okay, guys, that is our show for this week. Thank you very much for coming around and listening to me babble on here and asking me questions like this. I am more than happy to continue answering them for you, so keep sending them to me. And if you find this channel informative, educational, and entertaining, then perhaps consider joining me on Patreon because that is what keeps these lights on and keeps the show going. And I really, really, really want to acknowledge everybody who is supporting this show right now because it is you guys who are making this happen and keeping it going. And I I really cannot thank you enough. Seriously. All right, guys. Let's have a great 2021. See you next week. Bye-bye.